Last time on Graveyard Cars. We're trying to make this car look exactly like a real live Hemi Cuda. So other than the vehicle identification number, you will never know the difference between this car and a real Hemi car. This is the very first car we've ever built from the ground completely up. I gotta learn not to buy in to Doug's silliness. You know, at least Mark said, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's the same silliness. It's, it's that whole gene pool. This station will remain on the air. On this episode. If something is off just a hair here, by the time you get all the way over here, it's a mile off. So Mark has really worked closely with George. This car is the most intricate one we've ever done. What's a, what's a concert that costs 45 cents? More than I want to go to. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a bat mouth. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. Got one dog. And his cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Welcome back to Graveyard Cars. One thing I've learned about graveyard cars and about an assembly line production that we do here is the more people that can do more things, the Swiss Army knife type employee, the better it is for me. So while I have got Alyssa where she can do decals, if you look back to the 1971 Cuda 343 speed, one of eight, she did the billboards on that, did a beautiful job. But I've also been working with Justin, the Greenhorn, on how to do these. Now, he's very artistic and musician type guy, so this is really even more up his alley than the other stuff. In the case of Cindy's car, I felt comfortable in letting him put those decals on. It's almost baptism by fire, because of all the people in the world you don't want to screw up a decal on, it's Tony. Well, I should say in this particular case, it's Cindy. Although I think she's too sweet to get too crazy. But anyway, I let him do the decal on it, and he's doing a fantastic job. You know, I'm a little bit nervous since this is the first time um, that I've ever done the longitudinal stripe on a Challenger. So this is Tony's wife's car, and Tony is very spot on. There's a lot of pressure, but I think it'll go smooth. To really get that decal to lay down flat, use the correct solutions, use a nice little squeegee, get every single air bubble out of there that you can. So now that the stripe is actually on the car, we can actually move on to the rest of the assembly of the car. So when it comes to a major build like this 71 Hemi Cuda Tribute car, we have the advantage that Chrysler never had of taking our time and making everything as close to perfect as possible versus mass production, which is what happened in the assembly plants back in the day. Right now, we have two quarter panels and an upper cowl panel for our 71 Tribute Cuda. When it comes to doing the parts individually, it's another advantage. We can put the single stage acrylic urethane paint on both sides of the A-pillar and shoot some down inside it. Same thing for the rockers. We can put paint inside the rockers because they aren't on the car. We still have accessibility. So if our mind frame is what it is on this car to make it better than it ever was at the factory, we have the tools and the ability to do that. Quarter panels are off, so we have to do our texture coating first, get all that done on there, because once it's on the car, you can't do that quality of a job. So we use a sprayable seam sealer. It's a fuser product. It looks right. It's a great, great way to replicate the factory sound bending. So we get the texture on there just like factory did, get everything wiped down, come back in, then I'll spray the whole thing black. It's much easier to just come through, go around the whole entire car, just spot in the jams, and then that way these quarter panels are completely factory all the way around. And we kind of do the same thing with the upper cowl panel. And that cowl panel literally lays right here, goes right over the top, gets welded to the front. So you can't get paint back in here. A quality job. Nope, don't, don't even go over there, camera boy. Don't even look. My job is to make sure that Will does his job. When Mark knocks on the window, we found it best to completely ignore him. My other camera guy is on him. Willie Wonka! Ha ha! It's really disruptive having Mark come out any way you look at it. But when he disrupts the camera crew, that makes it even worse because we have a new producer, but we are toughening him up as the season goes. If I say, hey, don't buy into Mark's stuff, he's getting better about not turning the camera to look at him doing some silly dance or something that makes no sense. Hey, what's up? Sorry, I need this jam too. I want you to work on the, it's already been blasted, but it needs to be etched. I don't know why you well, didn't round everything. Ready. Why didn't you well, round this everything? This isn't even ready. Don't bring me stuff that's not ready. This is completely ready. It's enough. rusted. Yeah, it, that's why I said you scuff it down and you hit it with a scotch part. You didn't say that. You hit it with some. I you just asked. said etch. Yeah, etch doesn't get rid of rust. 
Oh my gosh, it doesn't? Mm -mm. I thought the phosphoric acid, I'm sorry. No. I thought some of the little funny things inside no. of it would, no. no. Okay, anyway, the other one doesn't need to be done. I need you to do this at the same time. So We've do gotta one be able not to the other. In. I want them painted with the uh, 9300. Thank you. Okay. So. Well, I'm gonna give this to Noah to prep. No, don't give it to Noah to prep, you just give it right here. Well, it's still not right. Okay, I wanna hang it on the tree and paint it at the same time. This is painted. He has a habit of, like, he'll mix up the paint, go to all the trouble of painting one rocker panel when the other one's sitting outside the booth. Why are you doing that? Go paint both of them at the same time. I have a question for you. Do you seal these? No, I don't. Okay. You don't seal them? So you just go single stage right over the top of this? Yeah. Gotcha, okay. What about the thiny? There are none. These are all thiny. That's bare metal. That's bare metal? Yeah. Okay, this is thiny. No, it's not. Yeah, they're thiny. No. Why, yeah. why the list? Because Phil used to have that why when he talked. Why. Yeah, he always had. <laughs> so I need etch over all this stuff. I don't want, I'm gonna I, make I sure. know. Okay. Will paints great, but I'm a great painter. That's what Rocky Balboa, see, that's, that's, what Mr. that's what Apollo Creed said. You fight great, but I'm a great fighter. That's what he said when they got in the ring and, and Rocky said, uh, I might be in here with the wrong guy. And, yeah, and they was, and then they stop right there on that punch. It's the eye of the tiger, it's the cream. Don't mean to micromanage, but I mean, I'm a yeah, businessman, you know. No, I don't, I just wanna make sure they come out. We've had a couple of little quality issues that we're working our way through and I think it's good if, if the old bull can come down off the hill and take care of business the old-fashioned way. Jamming parts and pieces is pretty simple. You know, we've covered it on the show for a number of years. There's no big payoff on it. We've done it a hundred times. I don't even understand why we're filming it, but Mark is the owner of the company and the producer's new, so he'll do whatever the boss says. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna give this to Noah to prep because it is rusty. Did you tell these guys all about this sound deadener? Yeah. That we use a factory replacement sound deadener and apply it in the exact same position yeah. and location that the manufacturer did back in the day. Right. Just checking. Thineath! Okay. And that's a big reason why I like to come in early, because you get a good at least three hours before Mark comes in. As you were, sir. Thanks. Yep, no. Will? You're welcome. I didn't say. You said thanks. Well, to you coming out. Yeah, and then you asked for And I just said, you said you're welcome. Yeah. Okay, so he brought me parts, which is cool, a part of a quarter panel, because he just likes to interrupt. Problem is, is it does have rust on that, so it's not ready to paint yet. It needs to be sandblasted. But just to appease him, I'll go get the stand, bring the stand in, hang that up, then he'll think it's getting done at the same time. Yeah, see, he's standing right there. So I'll just get the stand. You ever just want to open this door really hard when his nose is right up against it? So one of the nice things about being in the business where I'm at right now at this time period is so many parts are being made now for these cars that didn't used to be made. So you get the original radiator for the 69 and a half Super B. You could have paid a couple thousand dollars for one back in the day. Now you can get it from Classic Industries, Glenray makes them. They have the right part number, the right font. They have the right internal assembly plant codes that are on there that don't mean anything to anybody. They have the Pentastar. They even have date codes on the brackets. The style, the shape, everything about these radiators is exact to the factory, except that you can actually add another roll of cooling in it, and so the only way you'd tell that it had another roll of cooling is take the cap off and look down in there. The Chrysler thought ahead when it came to the performance cars. They knew they were gonna be driven hard. And so when you see the sales code for max cooling, it's a series of things, it's no one thing. It gives you the clutch style fan, gives you the fan itself, seven blade fan, Gives you a fan shroud, gives you the extra core radiator, the big radiator that cools the, the car down better, the capacity. So it's part of an entire package. And it's important when you're putting a car back together like this, that all of those things match what the manufacturer said should be in that car. So I got the radiator in place, everything went smooth. And I just gotta go find Doug and we can get the steering column in. As everybody knows, Tony D'Agostino is a good friend of mine. 
he helps us out with the show. What he'll do is we'll send him a rough edit of when I'm maybe rattling off a bunch of stuff on a car, because I don't need to check the fact books. I, if I'm wrong, I want to be wrong. I don't want to have to check the books and then find out that I was wrong. I'd rather have Tony do it, plus keeps him on his toes. So he was watching through an edit we did recently about a rear axle bearing getting pressed off, right? We were showing a press that we just got, and Doug was knocking the bearing off, and he goes, nobody knows what that is. And nobody uh, knows what that there is. Uh, that there needs more explanation. So when I got on the phone with him and we put words together and made a sentence and communicated, it turns out what he's saying is probably true. We, we showed you how to press an axle bearing on, but we didn't show you exactly how the axle bearing works in the car. And that's what we're trying to do is educate people more and more as we go on. So I had Doug take the camera guys aside and show them exactly from the engine to that very crucial axle bearing, why the axle bearing is important and all the pieces that are in front of it. And what I want to show you today is how the power gets from the engine to the rear end and how this all works. Here we have the engine. So you know that the engine has a lot of pistons inside going up and down, spinning a crankshaft. From the engine, inside here we have a clutch, which connects to the transmission and spins the shaft and the gears inside the transmission. So I've showed you the engine, I've showed you the transmission. Now I'm going to show you how the power from the transmission gets to the rear end. This is called the propeller shaft. It has splines inside this front yoke, which have the same spline as the output shaft on the transmission. So I'll show you how this slides into there and couples these two together. So the propeller shaft spins from the engine and drives the rear end. And I'll show you how the rear end works. So this is the third member or carrier or pumpkin which has the gears for the rear end. This is the yoke where the propeller shaft is going to marry from the transmission. So here's the propeller shaft with the U-joints. They're gonna bolt in just like that. And when this shaft is spinning, it's gonna turn the gears in the third member. I'll show you how the gears work. So now we're looking at the ring and pinion gears. This is the ring gear, these are the teeth. I'm gonna spin the yoke and show you how the gears turn. Inside here, you can see the pinion gear, which turns the ring gear. So when these gears are spinning, they're driving the splines that are inside here, which drives the axles. Inside here are splines that the axles fit into. You can see that spinning with the gears. So let me show you how the axles work. So here's our axle housing. We have two axles in place here. The carrier, or third member, is gonna bolt right in here. And the side of the carrier has the splined area, which is gonna drive the axles. Through the axle, to the flange where the wheel and tire are gonna bolt onto. Recently, I showed you how to install the bearings on these axles. This is the retainer that holds the bearing onto the axle. This is the flange that holds the axle into the housing. So when this is all in place, the axle can spin on the bearing. Once it's slid into place like this, you can see the axle spinning inside the housing. So let me show you how it would look from the inside. And that would be a wheel and a tire spinning, moving you down the road. Will's life is very, very easy. It's a very casual life. He floats along with the Pac-Man ghost, right? Everything's cool. You watch him walk up the stairs and he just floats up the stairs. He's got no stress. So my job is to add stress to his job. I got one more of these, Bubba. Where's Will? Willie! I've been with Mark for 25 years. So for me, getting through my day with him comes down to the fact that you have to treat him like one of your kids. Um, you block him out. So I wait till he physically comes to me and says, we got a problem, I need this, I need that. So you just have to block out most of him, treat him like a two-year-old, and then you'll be more successful in working for him for as long as I have. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I okay. got one more of these I needed to get. Well, I thought it already got jammed. You told me it already got jammed. I haven't before. jammed anything on this car. This needs to be jammed, too. Well, then why don't you just bring them all at once? Everything's in here now, my friend. You're good. Just, I just, I'm a businessman. You know what, if I didn't have to run the whole place, do you have any idea how many employees I have? Just take a wild guess between both companies. 20? 30. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, Name them. 
Name all my employees. 30 I want employees. all 30 right now. I can't name all my employees. Because you don't have 30 employees. I have 30 employees, no. trust me. Plus, no. we just got a great big kidney in here today, e Eclipse or whatever. Caleb. Whatever. Oh, like I can't like I can't name all my employees? I got over 30 employees. I got, I got Peter and Jeffrey and Derek, uh, Aaron and uh, there's Steve, all right? You go over to the body shop, there's George and, and Will, because he doesn't think I can do it, right? So it's not like, I mean, I could do them all if you got that much time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you want me to turn your booth on for you? So when I go in that booth, it isn't just to obstruct Will. All right, Eli, Doug. So, and there's um, Alan. I go in there because I have an obligation to make sure that everything works smoothly, okay? Fred. The first generation of Dodge Charger was in 1966 and 1967. The second generation, the best looking generation, was 1968 to 1970. And the third generation was 1971 to 1974 Dodge Charger. All three years of the second generation Charger were Hollywood heroes. The 1968 Dodge Charger became famous because of a movie with Steve McQueen called Bullet. The 69 Dodge Charger became famous because of a movie with Peter Fonda called Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry. What movie made the 1970 Dodge Charger famous? Was it Gone in 60 Seconds, Vanishing Point, Fast and Furious? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break, we'll find out. Okay, Ghouls, how did we do on that one? Now, this was a bit of a, a pop culture trivia question versus a technical one, but we gotta have a little fun. Everybody knows I like the old movies. All right. What movie made the 1970 Dodge Charger famous? Was it Vanishing Point, Gone in 60 Seconds, Fast and Furious? If you guess Vanishing Point, you're absolutely wrong, but you're close. Vanishing Point came out in 1971, starred Barry Newman, and it featured a 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. 444 speed, Yuko, D21 car, one of 916. But I'll give you an E for effort on that one. If you guessed Gone in 60 Seconds, it was a fair guess because there were a lot of really cool cars. I'm not talking about the remake with the weirdos in it. I'm talking about the original one. Well, I'm gonna give you another E for effort because there were a lot of cars in it. There were some pretty cool Mopars. Just wasn't a 1970 Dodge Charger in it. However, if you guessed Fast and Furious, congratulations, that's exactly right. It was Vin Diesel's car, was a 1970 Dodge Charger, the one that did the big wheelie at the end. So yeah, that was a fake wheelie. It, it, it was a prop that was put underneath the car to make it stand up. So on our Super B, uh, you'll notice that when they're putting the steering column in that there's a crack about six o'clock position in that steering wheel. Now it's not because I missed it, or we don't do quality work, so don't try to, I don't want to see the internet blow up with all that silliness. It's by choice. Having lost my mom a couple of years ago, I know how important that our memories are, and any links that we can have to our loved ones makes life that much better. So if you go back to like Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda, I presented her with the original steering wheel with its flaws in it, but it was the steering wheel that her dad drove for decades in that car. So now when she gets in that car, as cheesy as it may sound, and you shouldn't pass judgment until you've been in that position, it, it means the world to them, right? It hasn't been painted. It's not painted over. It's whatever fingerprints, DNA, spiritualness, whatever you want to say to it, it, it's neat. It's a neat thing, and that's why there's a crack in it. That's why we didn't use a plastic weld on it and fix it up and repaint it. I want, when Dave drives that car, I want him to have the experience of knowing that his dad touched the same steering wheel. What's the plan here, Justin? We're gonna get that steering column in. You ready? I'm ready. Sweet. I already got, I got the steering column marked for you. Thank you. When you're installing the steering column in one of these cars, there's a clocking that you have to do. So if you ever notice when you're driving your car down the road, the steering wheel, whatever that spoke is shaped like, that should be level and flat with the earth when you're driving. So what you do is you take the steering gear, you go all the way left, all the way right, back to the middle position, put that splined area straight up, and then there's also a splined keyed area on the column that matches the spoke at the steering wheel. All those come in and go down and get joined together. 
That way, when you're sitting in the car, the steering wheel is flat and the wheels are straight. You got that? Yep. Got to get it around that pedal. Hey, I got it. You got it in there? So I can't stand working with like Doug and Justin when they get together because they want to be funny. And I don't know why they're trying to be funny, but they're not funny. Why does the golfer take two pairs of pants to the course? I don't know. In case he gets a hole in one. Oh. I've been to funerals that are funnier than that. They come up with the stupidest jokes, the lamest jokes. They're knock-knock jokes. They're fart jokes. They're stuff from, I can't even say they're sophomore. They're sub-sophomore. They're like kindergarten. What's a, what's a concert that costs 45 cents? More than I want to go to. 50 cent and nickel back. Oh, nickel. You get change back? Yeah. Nice. I'd go to that one. So when I was growing up, I always wanted to be funny, right? I actually had a lot of the king of comedy, real stuff, not the stuff that got in weird suit. They, they have a whole thing called king of comedy. They're not. Only a few of them are kings of comedy, OK? Richard Pryor. I know I shouldn't be listening to Richard Pryor at 11 years old, but I was. But he's a king of comedy, so I patterned myself after that. George Carlin. Cynical little man, but funny, real funny. Your, your joke should have a way of intellect behind it. It should have a point behind it. It makes it so much funner for the listener. So the point of all that is, if you're sitting at home and you're watching these two guys work, I don't want to stop them from being in their organic situation. Don't come knocking at the ice tray saying, what's with that stupid lame show and those dumb jokes? Those aren't my jokes. You want, you want my jokes, you go back and you look at my stuff. All right? Mine all has a, a weight of intellect behind it. Okay, my jokes all have a point. They're not just random silliness like that. So enjoy yourself. You want to hear a two-year-old joke? Doug and Justin here, man. Should be a fun car. Four speed, right? Yeah. Nice. How fast do you think you'll get? 130. That's it? Speedometer says 150. Well, it depends on how hard you push the pedal. One more, buddy. Sorry, I forgot all about it. I got another one here. See, this is the problem. It's Willie! I got this one here. I thought you did the rear seal. You know it goes on between the frame rails, so there's no way we can possibly get to it after that. Anyway, make sure there's no thineth on it. See how the whole thing's thiny? Get rid of the thineth. That doesn't even get painted now. This gets painted. This gets painted. <laughs> Why wouldn't this get painted? And what uh, world don't we paint uh, things? Uh. Why in the world wouldn't we paint something? We don't paint. You know what part this is? Yeah, I know exactly what part that What's is. What's it called? Well, oh, I don't know the name of it. I just know. Rear... Can I finish talking? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Um, the whirly always mounts right through this. So one side gets painted, the other side gets undercoated. So we just don't worry about this side here. It's, yeah. it's just the adopted paint child that we don't have to worry about having protection on it. OK. You know what? <laughs> the adopted paint I'd, child. <laughs> I'd like to have that painted, please. And I don't want any tiny. So that, that's all basically my job. Alan. You know, that, that's my job. So it isn't a problem for me to come up with names. Alyssa, right? I mean, I know that's a given because it's my daughter, but what about Noah, the guy after the boat saved all them animals? I got a Noah out there. I got a Josh, which I've never trusted that name. So, you know, just, it's my job, Justin. I'll turn the boof on for you. Yeah, thanks. Boof! <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's that name from, Boof? There was a character named Boof. Teen Wolf. I know you call Yeah, Teen Wolf. Teen Wolf. Wolf. No shiny though, right? You'll scuff it? OK. <sighs> Dang, no, oh, you guys are going to film. Now you guys, yeah. Season 13. My initials, man. So the Super B is actually a bench seat car, which I just, I love the old bench seat. Uh, buckets were optional. Uh, you could have gotten buckets, and those buckets would have had headrests on them. I think it was in January or so of 69, they become required. Prior to that, they were optional. So while I'm not proud of the fact that we've had this car for way too many years, the installation of the seat is really getting down to the last few things that need to be done before this car can be QC'd, road tested, aligned, and hopefully delivered. All righty. Coming through, coming through, coming through. Mm -hmm. Watch the shifter. 
Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> tip it forward, see if it goes in. I got the front. All right, so do I. Nice. Yeah, man, that thing just fell right into place. Oh, we got lucky, didn't we? So another thing you might just notice for you purists at home, the shifter knob that is in the 69 and a half Super B, that's a replacement one. It's a white one with the shift pattern, and originally they were a wood grain ball, but Dave's dad had that shifter in his car all those years, and so it's the main reason, same thing as the steering wheel. I wanna keep and make sure that we have some heritage to the original car. Here we go. Oh, look at that. That thing slides nice. It works. Locks in place. Excellent. Seeing that go in for me is a huge milestone, knowing that we're just really a few weeks away from wrapping that car up. So while I have Constantino's parts, floor pans, quarter panels, everything, trying to get that jam work done. While that process is taking place, this is why we have another inflatable booth. Uh, it, it's invaluable. Winter time, you know, it's not a heated booth, so it, you really can't use it in the winter. But on nice days like we we're having right now, I'm in there painting, I can just, I can pump Noah parts, parts that need to be primer, dp 90 anything. He can just start rolling parts through that inflatable booth. So when we were at SEMA this last year unveiling Christine, I ran into these folks at Mobile Environmental Solutions. They make inflatable paint booths. And so we, we actually went over there as a team and, and looked at it and started talking to them. So this was like really perfect for us because a lot of the things that we need to do, we just need to get in the booth and spray a floor like on our 71 Roadrunner 446 Pro 4 speed car. I have Noah working on the 1971 Roadrunner. It's the one that Mark wasted half a day on to walk me around to give me pointless endless facts that I really don't care about other than what color it goes. That's the car. The car is already bare metal, so it's just a matter of getting it in the booth, wiping it down, getting it, making sure that metal's nice and clean before you do anything. Then after that, he'll go in and apply the DP90 because paint doesn't stick to bare metal. DP90 is great for the adhesion process. He'll put the EV2 Hemi Orange on top of it. That car is jammed, it's protected, and we can move it on to the next phase. We will start focusing on getting the uh, engine compartment primered, kind of covering up the bare metal. Then we can get it out to the Bondo room. They can start doing their body work. So we're at the point now where we have two booths going at the same time, almost all the time, especially through summer. I'm guaranteed I'm gonna get more parts painted at one time, Jerry. So. Got it all done, everything looks great. As soon as it's dry, I'll kick it over to George. Then George and Mark will team up together to start building this car back together and getting it welded. All right, so our 1971 Hemi Cuda Tribute car. The way you see it setting here right now is very much like a house that's being built. The foundation is square, true, and set. In this case, our A pillar and our B pillars are our walls. They are also set to perfection. We took our time because we're building this car from scratch and we have a lot more time than Dodge did back in the day or Plymouth to make these cars, we can dial them in closer. So when we measure the opening for the door, I could go out to an original car out back that's never been wrecked and have a quarter inch variance. That's why they have big slots in the hinges so you can move a door forward and backwards to make up for the mass manufacturing quality. In our case, we're within 1 32nd of an inch on every tolerance from front to back. If you set a level on the A pillars and the B pillars, they're to perfection. The rocker, perfection. Under seat pan, perfection. Trunk, perfection. Right now, the way the car is setting, we have our front and rear frame rail subsections. Did those a while ago. Our main floor is welded in at all the points it can be welded in. Right and left rear step well, under seat pan, inner and outer wheelhouses, quarter reinforcement door jam areas, A pillars, and trunk floor are all in. They're set exactly where they need to be for us to be able to put the roof on. So that's gonna be our next step after we finish prepping the car. If something is off just a hair here, by the time you get all the way over here, it's a mile off. 
So Mark has really worked closely with George side by side, just double checking things, making sure everything is perfect. So when it comes time for the final fitment, it goes together great. Not that George can't do it, it's just there's a lot of room for error and having Mark heavily involved is a huge asset. While we have our tribute car completely apart, this is a great time to show you exactly where all we have to seam seal. There's a lot of areas on these cars. It takes the guys a couple hours once you're ready to actually paint to do the seam sealing where the main floor meets the firewall, where it meets down the sides of the rockers, where it meets the step wells in the back and the under seat pan. There are a lot of panels that intersect and all of them have to be masked off. We try to duplicate the original seam sealer look. We use a urethane, they used more of a mastic back in the day and we paint over the top of ours where originally it was just the black mastic over the top of the, the painted floors. But this gives us a better seal. We know it's not gonna rust through anything and it all gets covered with carpet. So it's really the right way to do that. We're gonna move it over to Will so he can start prepping the metal the rest of the way and get it painted. As soon as he has it painted, single stage black, it'll come back in here in the exact same location and we'll put the roof on it. So we're about maybe 60% of the way done with this body build. We haven't had the opportunity before to do jam work when you don't have the roof on or the Dutchman, the quarters and whatnot. So Mark and I decided this is a great opportunity to get in here and get this paint work done. Now, it's probably gonna get scratched up a little bit here and there, but being able to reach those hard to reach areas is so great to be able to do that now. You know, get the wheel tubs, get stuff covered that you just really can't do that thoroughly when the car is put together. So Mark has rolled this car over, we got half of a car, I can get it painted black, get it back over to Mark, then he can start hanging the roof on, quarter panels and stuff like that. This car is the most intricate one we've ever done. Other than the roof section, everything was available brand new for our friends at AMD. So we have literally built a car from the ground up. A lot of people say that, but very, very few people have actually done it. And this car, because we were able to take our time and put it together with our knowledge and with our experience, I think it'll be one of the very best built raw frame cars from the frame up on the planet. Any chance we get to do more paint work, more jam work when a car's apart, we try to take advantage of. We haven't done a car to this state before when there's no roof on it. So while we haven't done it and factory doesn't do it, it gives us an opportunity to do just that much better of a job. So it's really looking forward to shooting all this. Plus it's 10 times easier because it's just one big flat panel. So you're not laying in there trying to get those hard to reach spots. You just basically start painting. I think at the end of the day, this is our best complete build from the ground up. It may not have the accolades as the Phantom Cuda or the Phoenix Cuda or some of the cars that we've done in the past, but from a standpoint of just pure knowledge that we've shared with you guys, pure technical, and having a finished product that's as good as anybody could do out there, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, today's my birthday. You, you won't use any of this. You're just looking for questions to delay getting the paintwork done, which in turn makes your guys go to lunch late, which in turn, they get mad at me. <laughs> Why, why, why is your whole face so red? Because I know you hate presents. I f hate. This is the best part. Why do you guys do this? Oh, it's not even a present. Oh, who's it from? Why did we decide that every year? Why don't you celebrate a birthday every week? Why, right? How, how come it has to be a year? It, it's ridiculous. It should be every 10 years. If a guy was really healthy and lived a long life, you ought to have about nine birthdays. You know what I'm saying? It, uh, Jeff. Oh, metal. So, you know, it really, and the birthday thing is, it's funny for me because the birthday thing, my hatred for it, I don't know if I'm the influence with Will, but he hates them too. He hates them too. But he's not aging as well as I am, and so he's probably hating it even more. I f hate birthdays because it's another day. It's literally another day. And between my phone being nonstop with kids and relatives and social media, it just dings every two seconds. People saying happy birthday, and I really don't care. It's just another day to me. I treat birthdays just like Mark. Why do you say birthday? Nobody cares about birthdays. You did it because it was a responsibility. Yeah, it was your birthday. All right? Happy birthday. Just like me, I don't want to hear birthday anymore. You don't understand. Right? You look at me and you think, well, God, the dude's, how long can he be in his 30s, right? But Will, he, he looks like one day older than dirt. Yeah, he wants to have presents. Yeah. As long as it doesn't have an, like anthrax in it. 
But outside of that, if they're good quality presents, please send them right here to the shop. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll leave that wrapped up. <laughs> As everybody in TV land knows, Mark Warman owned a 1970 Dodge Charger. It was FK5 burnt orange, had a white top, burnt orange bucket seat interior with console. The vehicle identification number, because I'm still looking for the car today, and I don't have the entire number, was X. P29L0G118. True or false, my 70 Charger was an RT model. Think you know the answer? Stay tuned after the break, we'll find out. You should know already. We'll come back after the break, I'll let you know. Mark, what the hell's going on here? I want answers. Are you dead or not? Is there another bomb or what? This is ruining my appetite. Answer me. Hang on a minute. A second ago, the broad with the mud said she's the one that tried to have Mark killed. You want to explain that, pal? Yes, it's true. I killed him. But it wasn't me who shot him. I stabbed him when the lights went out. I knew there was something weird with him. The glasses, the funny coat, the death threats. I knew this wasn't my husband. This is an imposter. When the lights went out, I heard him enter the room and did what I had to do. I stabbed him with the shifter. Oh, hang on now, uno momento, por favor. Are we to believe you just happened to have a pistol grip shifter laying around in your purse? Yes, Mark gave it to me for our 25th wedding anniversary. Back yeah, I could fly a gun shit, drive a thing, a million dollar equipment, I got a old job. If this isn't the Mark Warman, then who did you kill? Nobody. I took the liberty of examining the body. You'll notice there's no blood. This is not my dad. This is not a human at all. It's a mechanical puppet. <sighs> That's right. He's a fake. A dummy. A mannequin, if you will? What are you suggesting? Yeah, what are you suggesting? My dad was never here. This entire evening has been a charade meticulously set up by some imposter, using a finely crafted dummy to carry out his plan. And we're all looking at him. Very good, Alyssa. Very good. But there's one thing you forgot to take into account. I wasn't working alone. Okay, my ghoulish friends, how did we do? Now, that was just kind of a fun one to check and see if you guys have been paying attention over the last, well, let's see, 2012, almost 10 years, Graveyard Cars. That's right, they said it couldn't be done, but episode number 200 coming up. Now, remember, I've never been able to find my car. I would love to find my car. I, I'm no Papa John's. I'm not going to pay $20 million for the car if I find it, so don't. I do have most of the vehicle identification number. XP29L0G118. I just don't have the last three digits. The question was true or false. Was my charger, based on that vehicle identification number, an RT model? If you said true, shame on you. We've learned this. The vehicle identification number tells you if it's an RT model or not. XP, the second digit, is the price class. In this case, P stood for premium, which represented the Charger 500 model. If it was a non-500, it would have been XH. If it were an RT, like this beautiful little car right here, it would have been XS for special pricing. Also, my car was a 383 two-barrel. The RT XS29 was standard with a 444 barrel, 
375 horsepower, optional 446 pack 390, and the rare legendary R code 426 Hemi, which put out 425 horse. The 383, whether it was a two barrel or four barrel, was never available in the RT. But once again, what was my car? It was not an RT. It was a Charger 500 with a 383 two barrel FK5 burn orange with white top and burn orange interior, C16 center console sport wheel. I do this stuff all day if you want. Huh? So now that all of the work is done on the floors of the car, the basic structure, the framework, it's time to put the roof on our CUDA. Now, it's really easy to take for granted everything that we've done on this car so far, but making sure that all the things are where they're supposed to be in space so that it accepts this roof is what we've done all this hard work for. Now, before we can actually put the roof down, we have to prepare the areas that we just got through painting for welding. So when the roof comes down, the roof infrastructure pieces, the ones I don't make anymore, they're gonna intersect with the inner wheelhouse. That's all got paint on it now. So we need to grind that paint area back. We need to grind it back off the roof piece. Wherever there's an intersection, whether where it's the quarter panels meet the roof infrastructure, the Dutchman panel meets the rear wheelhouses, the A pillars meet the A pillars, B pillars meet B pillars, all those areas, if we're gonna do welding on them, we have to go back through, clean all that paint off in those intersecting areas and put some weld through primer on them. So this is the first car that I've built from the ground up and it's, it's a challenge. We are measuring everything, double checking everything, just to make sure we're spot on. And that's gotta be the hardest thing on this car because there's not really one reference point to go off of. Now we're at the point that I'm gonna grab a couple guys, I'm gonna grab Mark and we're gonna set the roof in place. Over there, uh, you can go end to end or side for side, whichever one you wanna do. Drop that front. Okay, drop the front down. Try not to put too much stress on those ears. Grab that. Grab it. One of the most rewarding things is to spend as much time as I did with George putting this car together and know that when the roof comes down, the A-pillar holes line up exactly with the pieces in the roof. I mean, exactly where they're supposed to be in space. There's no lifting and pushing and turning. They're exactly where they're supposed to be. Remember that roof's original. That's original geometry right there. So if everything that we built from the front frame rail sections to the rear cross member are all exactly where they're supposed to be, then when you set that roof down like this, it's gold. A pillars line up, B pillars line up. Roof sets even to the cowl and to the firewall and to the floors. So when you stand back and you look at the car, it's geometrically correct and without any manipulation. So that's a huge reward. Beautiful, just like that. Everything lined up perfect. Look at that hole right there. Absolutely yeah. perfect, perfect on that one. Perfect alignment on this side, gorgeous. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then the back needs to come forward and we're done. Beautiful, that's the way it's supposed to look. And now all of a sudden it's a car. Thank you, gentlemen. Just like that, George A. Finally, everything's coming together. I've got to say, out of this whole entire build, the most exciting thing has been working with Mark one-on-one. -on -one. I've got that reassurance that less things can go wrong. So as cars move through the shop, our Tribute 1970 Cuda 446 barrel six-speed Silver Sport transmission car is getting its decals on. Justin did a great job on Tony's car. He's really got the touch for this stuff. So it's so nice for me to walk away and know that he can put these hockey stick decals on and put them exactly where they go. No air bubbles, no dirt underneath it, no crooked, no tears, no anything, the way they're supposed to be. For me, it allows me to be able to go out and work in the rest of the shop at areas that still need my help. And we used to have a girl that worked here called her Mary Tyler Moore. She was really sweet and innocent like Mary Tyler Moore. I don't know what her name is. 